The second half, I like teaching a different type of series. How many of you remember a couple of weeks ago when I talk about the absence of the letter J and there was no Jesus or who you get saved in what name? Do you remember that? Wasn't that interesting? Well, I'm going to continue this theme. And what is titled under is Replacement Theology. Who has never heard of replacement theology? All right. It looks like everyone is familiar with replacement theology, which basically means the church has replaced Israel in God's redemptive plan. Now, instead of the temple having any significance, it's the church that has all the significance. Here, the Jews and Jerusalem have been replaced by Catholics in Rome. Okay? It's been replaced. Well, here's the thing. How many of you know we're grafted in? The problem with replacement theology, we're cutting off the limb that we're sitting on that's attached to the tree. And so uh, we have to understand that. And so what happens is so often, as I mentioned in the first service, everybody sees things differently, especially when it comes to the verses of the Bible, depending if you're looking at it from a Greek mindset or a Hebraic mindset. Let me give you an example. This is from Galatians 3.28. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. You're all one in Christ Jesus. How many have heard that? And how often do you hear the church say, well, look, there's neither male nor female, right? And there's, so we, we can't say there's neither Jew nor Greek. In other words, the Jews are gone, basically. But here's the problem with that theology. When you say there's neither male nor female, Where do you think we got the idea of there being over 100 genders now? Well, we say there's neither male nor female. If you say there's neither male nor female, well, then that justifies them having 107 some genders. When it says there's neither male nor female, they're not saying there's not either male or female. What they're saying is none of that justifies yourself before God. It doesn't matter if you're a Jew or a Greek. Before God, it doesn't matter if you're a male or a female. Females aren't lower than men. Men aren't lower than females. When it comes to God, we are all equal in his sight. It's not like this person's a slave and I'm a wealthy landowner, therefore God approves of me more. So a lot of people completely misunderstand this verse altogether. So when it comes to replacement theology... Think about this. I want you to put your hat on that you're a believer in the 1700s. In the 1700s, you're a believer. There is no Israel. Israel's been gone for 1,700 years, all right? Really up to almost 2,000 years. When you read about all the promises to Israel and there is no Israel, who are you going to think it belongs to? The church. That's what you're going to think. There is no Israel. And and it's been 1,700 years. Evidently, Israel's not coming back. So if the Bible is true and it's prophetic and we read all about these promises that are coming to Israel, then that must have referred to the church and not Israel. There can't be Israel. But what happens in 1948? Israel reappears according to a prophecy. And now the church has a problem. There's not room for both of us. Well, how many of you know we need authenticity? Here's what replacement theology has done. It's turned Yeshua from that into that. And then we wonder why the Jews don't recognize him. And here he is holding a Greek text. And if you'll notice... In every picture, he seems to have arthritis in his hands. 
I mean, something is wrong here. He needs to get healed. Actually, what that is, the Catholics painted these, but they cut that hand sign, I, I don't have it in my PowerPoint, comes from Hinduism and Buddhism, and they are trying to incorporate everything, uh, you know, they're trying to consolidate everything. And so that's what happens with replacement theology. Here we have Yeshua. During the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and he's got a big loaf of bread in his hand. And he's got these pink clothes on. Uh, and they don't have, and they're supposed to be reclining on the floor, not sitting at a table. And here he is looking up into heaven, and what is he thinking? Oy vey, get me out of these clothes. Get this loaf of bread out of my hand. Matter of fact, I don't think he'd even recognize his baby pictures. If you do a, an internet search for the mother Mary and Jesus, here's what you're going to get. The problem is everyone tries to create God in their image rather than realizing we're created in his image. Every single tribe, nation, tongue is in his image. Which one, big test, which one do you think the Apostle Paul looked like? Hmm. Uh, (laughs) The thing is this. When they think everywhere Israel is mentioned, you're to replace it with the church. Listen to Romans. Well, read all of chapters Romans 9 through 11. But let's look in particular at Romans 9, 3 through 6. The Apostle Paul is writing, or Rabbi Shaul, and he says, I wish that I was a curse from the Messiah for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. Who are the church? No. Who are Israelites? He's talking about his own kinsmen. According uh, to whom pertains the adoption. Who does the adoption pertain to? The Jewish people. The glory the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God, the promises, whose are the fathers, and of whom, as concerning the flesh, Messiah came, who is over all, God blessed forever, not as though the word of God has taken none effect, for they are not all the church who are the church. That doesn't make sense, does it? You have to stick with not, uh, for they are not all Israel, which are of Israel. The thing is, for the last two thousand years when there's been no Israel, the church assumed that they must be the ones to whom all the future promises to Israel referred to. And then as I said, all of a sudden Israel comes on the scene. And so what is the church to do? They say there's not room for both of us. This doesn't fit our theology. So the Christian Messiah could no longer be Jewish. Therefore, Mary becomes a Catholic his cousin John becomes a Baptist. His neighbors become Nazarenes. Yeshua becomes Jesus. Shaul becomes Paul. Yochanan becomes John. And Yaakov becomes James. That's what I talk about. A lot of believers, I don't believe in replacement theology. Well, then how come you continue to replace the calendar? How come you, you know, replace the Shabbat? How come, you know, and all of a sudden they realize replacement theology goes a whole lot deeper I'm going to tell you something that is going to come as a big shock. I'll never forget when I said it before, people thought I was a total heretic, but you have to listen to everything I say and not pick and choose. Do you know there were no churches in the New Testament? There were no churches in the New Testament. There were assemblies, yes, Yes, uh, John wrote to the seven assemblies. Why do I know there were no churches? They didn't speak English back then. Okay. Now, we're going to look at this, a couple of verses here. First off, just like I said, there was no J back then. 
okay? There were no churches back then. Now listen to in Acts chapter 2, verse 46. They continued, the apostles continued daily with one accord in the temple. Daily in the temple. Acts 5, 42. And daily in the temple and in every house they got together. They did not forsake the temple. As a matter of fact, there's another verse, I think it's in Acts 21, where it says, look at how many tens of thousands of priests there are who believe in Yeshua, and they still follow the Torah. And they still did sacrifices in the temple. They were priests. That was their job. How many believe the media is biased? (laughs) So were the translators who translated the Bible into English. I can't speak about other languages. I don't know the other languages, Spanish, Italian, you know, French, whatever. But in English, the translators were very biased. Listen to Acts. This is chapter 7, verse 38. It talks about this is he that was in the church in the wilderness. With the angel who spoke to him at Mount Sinai, with our fathers who received the lively oracles given to us. Well, this is Jewish people talking. Do you really think when Moses was at Sinai, there was a church in that wilderness that they attended? There was no church in the wilderness. But they write church in the wilderness. How many of you heard of the Septuagint? Okay, that's when... The Hebrew Bible was written into Greek. And this, who remembers when this happened? It was, a, you know, in the second century B.C. How many of you know there were no churches or Christians in 200 B.C.? Well, guess what? When they translated the word assembly... For Hebrew, into the Greek, they chose a word, ecclesia, or ecclesia. But what happened, the translators wanted to create something separate from the Jewish people in the synagogue, so they translated ecclesia as church rather than assembly. Now, you got to remember, it didn't even get into English until the 1600s. So 1,600 years have gone by, and they're taking the Greek word for ecclesia that was used in 200 B.C. when there were no churches, and they decided that word means church. Well, I tell you what, when we're in the wilderness, the ecclesia was Israel. It was an assembly. But now listen to what happens. Do you remember in Acts 19 where they are all worshiping the great goddess Diana of the Ephesians? Okay? And for hours, they were silencing the Jewish leaders and they were screaming, great is Diana of the Ephesians for several hours. And it says in Acts 19.34, but when they found out that he was a Jew that was speaking, everyone with one voice cried out for about two hours, great is Diana of the Ephesians. So there's this huge assembly that is crying out, great is Diana of the Ephesians. And in verse 34 or 41, it says, uh, and when this town leader had spoken, he dismissed the assembly. Well, wait a minute. What's the word? The word's ecclesia. Well, how come they didn't put down, then they dismissed the church? Oh, wow, because now everyone will think the church was worshiping the great goddess Diana for two hours. So now we're not going to translate it incorrectly. Well, I mean, we're going to translate it correctly as an assembly. Just like the media today will pick and choose the words to try to define the news for you. Here the translator had the Greek word ecclesia, thus they translate everywhere as church, but at this particular point when they don't want it to be church, they translate it correctly as assembly. Interesting. Okay, now, listen to Acts chapter 18, verse 26. 
It says, he began, now this is after Messiah's risen, ascended, gone. These are the disciples and the apostles working. And it says, and he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. What's the Greek word for synagogue? Synagogue. You can look at synagogue and you're going to think synagogue. You can look at Ecclesia now and you think church. But both of them were synonyms. It was the same word like father and dad. They both meant assembly. A Mariner's baseball game is an ecclesia. A Mariner's baseball game is a sunagage. They both meant assembly, but the church wanted to create a separation. So listen to this. How many of you know James was not James? Okay, his name was Jacob. You go and you look at any Greek Bible and you look up James 1.1, 1, 1, it says Yaakov. But we decided to translate it as, they translated Yaakov as Jacob all through the Gospels. But now there's been a big change, so now Yaakov becomes James. But anyway, you're going to be familiar with the verse in James 2, 1 and 2. And it says, if one comes into your assembly... A man with a gold ring, goodly apparel, and there also come in a poor man in vile raiment. You know, don't give them preference. Everyone familiar with that verse? Guess what the Greek word for assembly is in this verse? It's sunagage, because sunagage means assembly. But the translators don't want us to think they were still meeting in a synagogue, so they forget sunagage and translate it as assembly instead of synagogue. But now what happens in Revelation chapter 2, verse 9, it says about these Jewish people who are of the synagogue of Satan. What's the Greek word synagogue? Ooh, let's translate it as synagogue now. Instead of these are of the assembly of Satan. Because they're biased and want to influence you thinking the synagogue has to do with Satan, but they're sure not meeting in a synagogue. You can look at all these up, look at any Greek translation. But if you, you don't know what you don't know, just like in our news today, we get so much bias and we assume that it is true. Everything is filtered, people. Everything is filtered. You have to read everything is biased. That's how you have to approach everything. So do you understand when I say there's no churches in the New Testament? I'm, I'm saying there were assemblies. They assembled together, but we have to get rid of the English mindset. Now, not only that, when the new heavens or the new Jerusalem comes down out of heaven, it's not Rome that comes down out of heaven. Listen to Revelation 21, 10 through 13. John says, he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. Because remember, everything's based on the pattern. Whatever's up there is what's down here. And he told the Jewish people to make the pattern. So here comes that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. Her light was likened to a stone most precious, like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. It had a wall that was great and high, and it had 12 gates. And at the gates were 12 angels, and the names were written thereon on the gates. That's descending from heaven. That's still future. And it says, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel? What? Are you telling me there's not a Pentecostal gate? There's not a Baptist gate? There's not a Catholic gate? What? There's a gate for the tribe of Judah that you're going to be able to enter. Listen to Ezekiel. Revelation gets this from the book of Ezekiel. In Ezekiel 48, 31, it says... And the gates of the city will be after the names of the tribes of Israel. Gee, when we connect Revelation to Ezekiel and it talks about the future, here it's telling us that's what it's named after. I think it's interesting. There's three gates that are to the north. 
All right. I don't know how many of you have memorized where the tribes all settled around. But who was on the north? Okay. You have Dan, Asher, and Naphtali. That's the two sons of Bilhah uh, and the, uh, yeah, and uh, Leah. Okay. But listen, this time, it, all the gates are going to be changed. This time, Reuben, who was on the south, is now on the north. Judah, who was on the east, is now on the north. And Levi, who didn't have a gate, is now on the north. And on the east side, which had Judah mainly, okay, Zebulun and Issachar, who were all Leah's kids, this time on the east side is going to be Joseph and Benjamin, who was on the west. Joseph was Ephraim and Manasseh divided, but this time Ephraim and Manasseh are together. It's just Joseph, Benjamin, these are Rachel's kids now, and one for Dan, which is one of Rachel's handmaid's kids. And then it says, uh, let's see. Where am I at here? Okay. Then it says here on the south, now on the south side, okay, here's who we have now. Oh, south side, south side. uh, Simeon, Issachar, and Zebulun. And at the west side is Gad, Asher, and Naphtali. So they're all getting scrambled around from where they were initially. Now it's going to be different. But as I said, there is no Catholic, Methodist, Lutheran, Baptist, or Pentecostal gate. They're named after the tribes. Okay, now, when did replacement theology begin? A lot of people think it began with Constantine. That's not correct. It began much, 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 much earlier. When do you think was the first people group that tried to replace Israel? Who were they? When? What year? Think about the Gospels. Who did the Jews hate? The Samaritans. The Samaritans. That's them half-breeds. Okay, so let's look at the story. In 2 Kings 17, 21 through 23, Solomon has died. Reuben's taken, oh, uh, not Reuben. Uh, Here you have uh, Solomon's son, Jeroboam and Rehoboam. Rehoboam is Solomon's son, but God split the kingdom in two, right? Jeroboam got the north and Rehoboam got the south. So here we are. Here's a map. And when people talk about the lost tribes, it's not really 10 lost tribes because Simeon never had a land and they were absorbed in Judah. So in the south actually was Judah and Benjamin and Simeon and many of the Levites. But what happened when Jeroboam tore it apart, their main uh, people were Ephraim and Manasseh, that is what was when it refers to the north. Yes, it included these other tribes that are further north, but the main thing was the, what is not, not, now even known as the, the West Bank. All right? But here, Ephraim and Manasseh were right there, and Ephraim, it says, was the head of the northern tribes, and Judah was the head of the southern tribes. They were known as Ephraim and Judah. The two sticks in Ezekiel, Ephraim and Judah. Okay? So this is what happened. And so, but listen to this. It says, uh, they made Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, king. And Jeroboam, it says, drove Israel from following the Lord. Even the Lord gave them all these tribes. He drove them because Israel is the north, Judah is the south. And it says, they made them sin a great sin because the children of Israel walked in all the sins of Jeroboam and they didn't depart from them until the Lord had to remove Israel out of his sight as he had said by all of his servants, the prophets, Isaiah and everybody. So Israel was carried away out of their own land into Assyria. But watch what happens here. In verse 24 through 26, very next verses, 
So what happens, and what the governments did back then, they would take all the people that were in that land and transport them to another country, and they would take all the people from that country and transport them over to that country so they have no sense of direction, they have no national pride. It's all a matter of uh, that's how they would become their slaves and servants. They would just move them to other nations. And so what do we have here? In 2 Kings 17, 24 through 26, the king of Assyria brought men from Babylon and from Kutha and Abba and Hamath and Shepharavim and placed them in the cities of Samaria instead of the children of Israel. And they possessed Samaria. Guess who comes from Samaria? Samaritans. And they dwelt in the cities. And so it was at the very beginning of their dwelling there. They did not fear the Lord. Therefore, the Lord sent lions among them and killed them. I don't know if you knew there were lions in the Middle East back then. He didn't slay all of them, but a lot of them. And it says, wherefore, these strangers to this land spoke to the king of Assyria, saying, the nations which you've removed and placed in the cities of Samaria don't know the manner of the God of that land. Therefore, he sent lines among them and killed them because they don't know the manner of the God of the land. Back then, they always thought there was a different God for every nation. And so if they got sent to that nation, they had to make sure they served that nation's God or they'd be in trouble. So what they wanted to do was send a whole bunch of the Jewish people or Israelis back And they would intermingle and they would teach them. So they had Levites and different tribes come uh, that had the priests that would show them how to serve. But guess what? They all intermarried and that's where the Samaritans came from was the Israelites who came back after they were taken captive and intermingled with the other countries that were now put there. Okay? And so they were considered half-breeds. And so the Jews didn't like them or respect them. And so now what happens, it says the king of Assyria commanded saying, carry there one of the priests whom you brought from there and let him go and dwell there and let him teach the man of the God of the land. So one of the priests whom they had carried away from Samaria came and dwelt in Bethel and taught them how they should fear the Lord. How many of you know we should fear the Lord? But what does that mean? Is it, is it good to fear the Lord? Is it ever not good to fear the Lord? Well, let's read what the Bible says. 2 Kings 17, 29. It says, how be it every nation made gods of their own and put them in the houses of the high places which the Samaritans had made every nation in the cities wherein they dwelt. Do you realize 2 Kings 17, 29, this is around 700 BC and the Samaritans, that's what they were known. From 700 BC was the Samaritans. So listen to uh, the next few verses in 2 Kings 17, 32 through 33. It says, so they feared the Lord and they still made to themselves the lowest of them to be priests of these high places, which sacrificed for them in the houses of the high places. They feared the Lord, but they served their own gods after the manner of the nations whom they carried away from there. They kept fearing the Lord, but they still did what they wanted to do. So it's not good just to fear the Lord as far as retribution, but still continue to do what you're doing, hoping you don't get it. In other words, we're serving God out of fear of punishment, not at, or hope of reward, not out of love. Now, here's something that Josephus, how many heard of Josephus? Josephus, Josephus lived during the time of the Messiah. He's a historian. And he wrote about the events that were happening. But guess what? He was biased. Just because you read what he says, you have to realize he was biased like everybody, other reporter. How many know reporters are biased? In his book that he wrote called The Antiquities of the Jews Concerning the Events of Hanukkah that happened around 170 B.C. He he wrote about the events that happened around 170 B.C. And he says this. When the Samaritans saw the Jews were under all of these sufferings of what Antiochus Epiphanes was doing, they no longer confessed that they were related to them. They always were teaching that they were the real people of God. But now that the people of God are being killed, we're not the people of God. 
And it says they confessed they were no longer related, nor that the temple that they had on Mount Gerizim even belonged to Almighty God. They said, we are aliens from their nation and from their customs. Let our temple here be named Jupiter Hellenius. So they believe that, you know, on Mount Gerizim is their temple. It's a temple of God until persecution comes, and then it's no longer the temple of God. In Matthew 10, 5 and 6, Yeshua sent out the 12 after giving them instructions you are not to travel by the roads of the heathen and do not enter into any town belonging to the Samaritans. But rather, you're sent with the purpose of going to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Okay, that's how they started. But then in John 3, 5, it says Yeshua left Judea. In other words, he told them not to do it, especially on their own. But I think that's almost the same reason I tell Christians not to witness to Jews because they're completely ignorant on how to win them. I don't want Christians to witness to Jews because they teach replacement theology. Do you remember how Joseph's brothers didn't recognize him? Why? He looked and acted Egyptian. Why do the Jews don't recognize Jesus? Because how we're presenting him. The Jews now, he hates Torah. He only likes Greek. He hates the biblical holidays. He gave up on the Sabbath. Why don't you believe in him? That's why I think he said, don't go to the Samaritans. Because they were going to go with a total judgmental attitude, no mercy, beat him over the head with the Torah, and you don't win people that way. Okay. So, watch this. John 4, 19 and 20. Here we have him speaking to the Samaritan woman at the well. And of course, this Samaritan woman is very righteous. And if you don't realize that, I'll talk to you later if you want to know why. But she says, I know you're a prophet. Our fathers worshiped here in this mountain, but you say it's in Jerusalem as a place where to worship. All right, well, guess what? The Samaritan woman... She knew the Messiah was coming. She worships God. Yeah, her doctrine screwed up, but what church doesn't have screwed up doctrine? Okay? But she loved God. She worshiped God. She knew the Messiah was coming. Okay, now let's look at Acts 8, 25. It says, and they, when they had testified and preached the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem, and then it says, they preached the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. God always wanted them to go to the Samaritans, but not until they were trained and filled with the Spirit. Okay. I'm going to be wrapping it up with this. Most of you know this who've been here for a while. But how many of you know I can show you a verse in your Bible where the Apostle John was kicked out of the church? Is anyone who didn't know the Apostle John got kicked out of the church? I'm going to give you the verse where the Apostle John was kicked out of the church. Not only him, but every Jew was kicked out of the church. Okay. And even any Gentile who wanted the Jews to stay, they were also kicked out of the church. Can you imagine? Who wouldn't want the Apostle John in their church? Well, this is, it's in every Bible. It's always overlooked. But what happens after the temple was destroyed, they were still meeting in the synagogues, not in churches, uh, and they were being scattered, and the non-Jews who are getting saved are entering the synagogues, as was the big battle in Acts, and now, after a while, they think they got the Bible understood when they've never studied the Torah at all. Their only moral basis is Aristotle and Plato. And so here... Let's see. Do you remember how Yeshua told his disciples not to have a Greek mindset and lord over the flock, always wanting to have the preeminence? Do you remember that? Here it is. In Mark 10, 42 through 44, Jesus called them to him and he said to them, you know that they which are accounted to rule over Gentiles exercise lordship over them and their great ones exercise authority on them. 
but so shall it not be among you. But whoever will be great among you will be your servant. Whoever of you will be the chiefest has to be the servant of all. Right? Okay. Here we have this guy named Diotrephes, which means lover of Zeus. He is not a Jew. You can tell by his name. Like if I told you my name was Paco, I'm not from Russia. And if I told you my name was Igor, I'm not from China. Okay? Diotrephes is not a Jewish name. It means lover of Zeus. He is one that wants to have authority and preeminence over the flock. So let's look at 3 John. Here it is. In 3 John chapter 1, there's only one chapter, verse 9 and 10. He says, I wrote to the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to have the preeminence, does not receive us. Right there. He, when he says us, he's speaking about the Jewish people. He does not receive us. Therefore, he says, if I come, I will call to mind his deeds, which he does, prating against us with malicious words. So not only does he not receive us, he slanders us with all these malicious words. And the us, us is the Jewish people, the apostles in particular. Then it says, and not content with that, he himself does not receive the brethren, which means he does not receive the other Jews. And then it says, he forbids those who wish to. So he forbids those Gentiles who wish to receive them, the other Jews. And it says, he kicks them out of the church. It's right there in 3 John 1, 9 and 10. Here a leader has taken over the synagogue, not the church. And he's kicking all the Jews out. Speaking slanderous, Lashon Hara against them. Kicks out any Gentile who would want the Jewish people in. Isn't that amazing how quickly anti-Semitism took over? Okay, I'm going to close with just a couple quick pictures. How many of you ever heard of Copernicus? Here's, he lived from 1473 to 1543. So he was around during the time of Martin Luther. He was around in the time of the Crusades. Okay, he was a Polish astronomer. His name was Nicholas. All right. And he never liked the earth-based theory, thinking the entire universe rotated around the earth. He said, no, it rotated around the sun. And guess what? The Catholic church leaders condemned him. They wanted to kill him. And they killed many teachers and astronomers who thought that way. They had a total, even in 1568, they had an earth center theology with all of the planets revolving around the earth. And you would be insane to think that. We know now. But back then, that's what the church taught. And they were some of the leaders in science and astronomy. And they literally killed a lot of people who thought that it was the universe revolved around the sun. Okay, well, the problem with much of Christianity they think everything revolves around the church. It doesn't. Just like an earth-centric theory that everything revolves around them. It's like the church is at the center of the theological universe. That's what's in all of Christianity. But it's not Jerusalem is at the theological center and Israel of the universe, and we're grafted into that. But your perspective is going to be different if you're looking at it from a Greek Christian church mindset. That's why we have to look at, at it from a Hebraic Jewish mindset. Now, who wants to be deceived when the Antichrist comes? If you're looking at an Antichrist from a church Greek perspective, you're going to miss it. I'm not saying the Jews are going to get it, but I'm saying that believers have to look at the Antichrist from the Hebraic mindset. How many of you know the two witnesses come and they preach for 42 months? Right? And then it says, at the fifth trumpet, 
the locusts ascend, and then they are killed, and they lay on the streets for three and a half days. And then there's another three and a half years, and that is when the Antichrist and the false prophet are going to rule, right? So who comes first? The two witnesses. And the two witnesses are Jews. I believe it's going to be uh, Enoch. Uh, I don't mean Enoch. I mean Elijah and Moses, representing the law and the prophets. And that's who appeared at the transfiguration, which is what's going to happen at the last days at the Feast of Tabernacles. But anyway, think about this. What is the church going to think if these two witnesses appear and they are Jews in Jerusalem telling everyone to return to the Torah? And what are they doing? They're stopping rain for three and a half years. They're turning water to blood. Fire comes out of their mouth and they kill people. All the Christians are going to think, that's got to be the Antichrist and the false prophet. They're destroying everything. They're not lovers. And then when the Antichrist and the false prophet appear, these slick, willy preachers saying, it's all love. Just love everybody. They're going to think, that's got to be Jesus. And, uh, you know, the prophet that killed those two bad guys. <laughs> the deception, I'm telling you, is going to be so strong because we're looking at it through a wrong perspective. This is why we have to look at it through this lens. Does that make sense? Okay, for the next several weeks, I'm going to be going over replacement theology because the last thing I want is anyone to be deceived. 